Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Beneath the Surface, where we discuss political, social and Islamic affairs taking place around the world. Today we'll be discussing martyrdom and joining us in the studio is Vicar of Christ Church and the author of two books, Stephen Sizer. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's start off with um, what is a martyr? The, uh, f- Jesus called his followers uh, to a path of self-sacrifice. Jesus said, uh, whoever is not willing to take up his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Meaning, unless you put the world behind you, unless you turn your back on the temptations of the world, the idea that you want to be secure through material prosperity and so on, unless you put that behind, you cannot be faithful to follow Jesus. Because to follow Jesus involves simplicity, poverty, chastity, um, humility, uh, and and servanthood. And so at the very core of the Christian faith is the belief in martyrdom, but it's a living martyrdom, being willing to give up your life in order to find your life. Jesus said, um, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, Uh, meaning uh, when we when we invest our lives in God's will, we find a fulfilling life and an everlasting life. You know, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever follows me uh, will uh, will live forever. Um, He, you know, he used the analogy of um, a seed that must die before it can Uh, bring to life, you know, through a tree or a plant. And uh, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about uh, not being conformed to this world, becoming worldly, but being transformed, transfigured by the renewing of your mind, he says, and this is your acceptable sacrifice of worship. He says, uh, living sacrifices. So, Martyrdom in a Christian sense, um, in, in the core teaching of Jesus and his apostles, was a lifestyle, an attitude toward the world, knowing that you were going in one direction while the world was going in the other direction. Very early on in the early church, it did lead to literal martyrdoms. The first Christian martyr was Stephen, uh, same name as me. Um, He was martyred because he spoke God's word and the people didn't like what they heard and they stoned him to death. And many of the early Christians were martyred because they were seen as a threat to the Roman state. Indeed, many of the early Christians were accused of being atheists because they didn't believe in the foreign gods. They didn't believe in the the, Caesar was a god, for example. They worshipped the one true God. So... Martyrdom is not something, literal martyrdom, is not something we should go out there and seek, like kill me, but we should be willing to give our lives if if we have to choose between obeying God and obeying the world, if we have to choose between worshipping God and worshipping other idols. So martyrdom is a very important concept within Christianity. That's very similar to the Islamic um, teachings. But sometimes, even like when many um, Islamic scholars are to say this, it's very easier to say, you know, give up life and, and, and live like a martyr in the sense that, you know, when you're, you've got the choice between following God and following the world, you, you just take that step straight away. And hopefully we'd all take that step, but sometimes just thinking about it, it's quite hard. Just, you know, you would be like, would I really take that step? Mm. So how do you think can um, Christians and hopefully Muslims would also learn from this? How can we take that step that if we were to take a choice, we would know what to take? Mm. Well, alongside the concept of martyrdom, and that's what, uh, you know, the, the word in Greek has to do with being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus. So it's synonymous, martyrdom is synonymous with living as a follower of Jesus. Alongside that, you have the concept of jihad, the struggle. 
And in Christian thinking, in biblical thinking, jihad is an internal struggle, to answer your question, with, with sin, with um, all that draws me to find my security and my hope and my peace in material prosperity, in, uh, in, in tangible things. Um, and, and so the struggle is to follow God and, and obey him and resist that, uh, that temptation. It means uh, the willingness to struggle uh, against oppression, against injustice, against evil, when it is manifest in our society or in our community or in our nation. So the willingness to, um, to, to challenge corruption, to speak out against oppression, even to the point where uh, one's life is in danger for doing so. It, it's what Christ calls us to do. And his example was one where he spoke plainly even to those who opposed him. For example, at his trial, uh, when Pilate challenged Jesus, he said, don't you realize that I could take your life? Uh, Jesus said, um, you will only be able to do that if God has decreed it to happen. Um, if God wanted to, he could send 10,000 angels and liberate me. Uh, but that was not going to be God's will. Um, so he had a, a confidence that he was being faithful to God's will. And, and that's what he calls his followers to do also. One of the martyrs in the early 20th century, uh, a man called Jim Elliot, he was an American missionary. He felt called with some friends to work among the Indians in the Amazon. Uh, they were a, a tribe who were quite uh, aggressive. They were, they were uh, quite um, dangerous and uh, they had a reputation. But he felt that they needed to hear about Jesus. He and his friends went into that community and, and they were murdered, they were martyred. Uh, but because they didn't retaliate, because of their, their love and their compassion for those people, the very people who murdered them began to feel convicted that they had done wrong. The wives of the martyred missionaries went back to that community and they sought to help that tribe uh, uh, see the light and be transformed. And in the end, some of the people who had been responsible for the killings uh, became followers of Jesus. And as a sign of their, uh, their repentance, a sign of their uh, for, uh, a desire to be forgiven, uh, it, one of the families asked that the man who had murdered their f husband baptize the children. So th there was a, a reconciliation in that community. But Jim Elliot said something before he died. He wrote something in his diary, and I've always used it as uh, one of my own motivations. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And within Christian uh, theology, our hope is in God and in the belief that he will give us eternal life. And therefore, we recognize this life is temporary. This life is transient. We are only one heartbeat away from death. And if we go through life believing I'm going to die one day, but my hope is in my eternal life, then we will give ourselves fully in this life and not be afraid of losing it. If we're not afraid of giving up what we can't keep to gain what we can't lose, we become very powerful and dangerous to the enemy. That's like um, the Islamic belief in the sense that Imam Hussein salam, also stood like up against oppression mm. and injustice and he was um, martyred on the plains of Karbala because he was against what was taking place in Iraq at the time. Mm. You know, the ruler was killing as many people as possible mm. and teaching the wrong um, uh, rules of mm. the Islamic faith. Uh, and when he became an example to many sins. He, he did. And it's just like um, Jesus in a way. 
that they both stood strong and um, they were against oppression. Do you think that the Christians and the Muslims today are standing up um, for the people that are being oppressed as much as we should, as much as our um, holy figures have taught us? No, I think we can do a, a lot more. Uh, clearly, um, there is within Christian thinking what's called the just war theory, that war is justified as a last resort when diplomacy has failed, when um, the use of force is necessary to resist uh, an aggressor who is, uh, is powerful and unless he is resisted, uh, you know, um, women and children especially will be killed. But that just war theory insists that uh, a war must be winnable, because if you can't defeat the enemy, then it is better to give in than, uh, than to, you know, for lives to be taken when there is no point. It must be against uh, combatants, not against civilians. Uh, women and children and non-combatants must be protected, must be respected. Uh, those involved in, in medical services must be respected. Uh, prisoners must be cared for. Those who, who surrender must be uh, cared for, provided for. Um, retaliation must be proportionate in proportion to uh, the aggression. These are, all, these are kind of principles that are known as the just war theory. And so within that context, um, Christians can justify the use of force in defense, not in attack, but in defense. Um, it, gets, it just gets very problematic when we are talking theoretically, say, about Syria and um, you know, how we should get involved. I would support the rule of law. Let's take that as an example. Uh, I, would, I would accept uh, the need to, to work with the government, even though the government is imperfect, the government may have made mistakes in the past, uh, and, and work for the best interests of the people as a whole, and resist those who are seeking to divide the country, turn one ethnic group against another, who commit atrocities, as we're seeing committed by ISIL or ISIS. And, and so I would justify the use of force to, to, to resist that. But as you said, it's very important that the faith communities work together and not allow the enemy, not allow the evil one to divide us and, and, and cause confusion and, and infighting, if you like. Sadly, um, ISIS as a group is using the concept of martyrdom and jihad in the sense that um, they would be bombing, uh, they're wearing bombs around their waists and stuff and going to different areas mm. around Iraq and Syria and they've done it even um, in Europe and stuff just to uh, gain that martyrdom um, feel in the, in the sense that mm. they're going to hopefully be going to heaven and stuff. Yes. But sadly they are using it in the complete wrong way because yes. that's not what Islam speaks no. of. And to be a martyr is, as you said, there are many rules yes. to it, you know, just like the Christian faith, yes. Islam also believes the same. Did something um, like this also happen in the Christian faith where people understood martyrdom wrong? Well, yes. I mean, the, as I said on a, in a previous program, how uh, the church was co-opted by the state at various times in the past. And during the era of the Crusades, for example, the church very much got behind the, uh, the political agenda, which was the conquest of the Middle East, um, for, for material reasons rather than for spiritual reasons. Um, you know, before the Crusades, it was possible for Christian pilgrims to visit the holy sites, and and you know, the, the respect of religious convictions and traditions is more important than extending our empires. Um, you know, this earth belongs to God, and our role is to live humbly as His servants on it, and re respect the rights and privileges of others. Uh, so at times in the past, uh, the just war theory has been abused. 
And it's lamentable that Christians have been in the forefront of exploitation and war and conflict in many parts of the world. But that doesn't invalidate the, the role of the church to speak out against it when it occurs, even when it's being perpetrated by our own government. And um, hopefully, like, things would get better in, um, like, when it comes to that situation. But the thing is, um, when we look at Syria, for example, many Christians, and even Iraq, um, many Christians have actually um, been faced with, you know, a lot of attack and stuff. But we're not seeing much help when it comes to um, both faiths, no. like, around the world, across the world. No. You've got many countries that are very quiet about it, and then... Sadly, um, unfortunately, Britain and the US Army are, are going in and stuff, and I doubt that they'll actually be helping the mm. people. But what can we as Muslims and Christians do to help the people in Iraq? Well, one of the most important things we can do is, um, is educate our own youth, because invariably it's the youth who get caught up uh, in idealistic notions and uh, get sucked into joining the opposition in Syria, for example, or being attracted to ISIL. So we have a very important role to play in our mosques and churches in, in the West, dissuading young people from feeling that they must go and help because their naivety and their immaturity and their, their, their enthusiasm so easily get twisted and exploited by those who will manipulate them and use them as suicide bombers, as, as their, their foot soldiers. That's a, one very important thing. Um, the other is to work with faith leaders in Syria and Iraq, Muslim and Christian, and give them the support they need to continue to work together to bring healing locally in communities uh, and, and to resist um, the destructive influence of people like ISIL. The Kurds, for example, have, have a, a sense of unity and cohesion that we need to, uh, we need to learn from and work with uh, in Iraq and in Syria. Ironically, I'm not advocating women joining the army, but I do understand that ISIL, that their terrorists, are afraid of um, being killed by a, a, a female soldier because apparently they won't go to heaven. So. <laughs> There is certainly some merit in, uh, in, in encouraging the women to, to find ways of confronting. Certainly in Palestine, when, uh, you know, when Israeli soldiers are uh, oppressing uh, people in the Palestinian territories, to see women, Palestinian women, stand up to them and confront them, um, it makes them think twice about what they're doing. You know, it's very easy for a soldier to attack a Palestinian man. It's much harder for them, in their consciences at least, to attack or uh, to, to beat uh, a Palestinian woman. So we need more women to get involved then? More women involved. I think if our world was run by women, we'd have less wars. <laughs> we need more women then to, to try and get into politics, definitely. hopefully. Definitely. But, um, Speaking of oppression, in Saudi Arabia, um, a Shia uh, um, scholar has actually been imprisoned for uh, four years. He had um, four bullets in his leg mm. and he wasn't going In Saudi to be, Arabia? Yep. Yeah, and he was, they, t um, they didn't want to uh, medically treat him, but they were kind of like forced to because at the time everyone and was against... And now he's been condemned to death. That's the thing. And what can we do, do you think? to help him? Humanly speaking, I think there's very little we can do because the Saudi authorities seem uh, impervious to criticism from the West. Um, but I believe in God and I believe God is powerful. He will hold those who are uh, abusing this religious leader accountable. I believe if we can help uh, our American friends to recognize that um, what Saudi Arabia's leadership is doing is destroying Saudi Arabia as much as uh, what they're doing to the Shia community or the Christian community in Saudi Arabia. Um, we've got to show that um, to punish or penalize or worse, as we're seeing here, 
execute someone because they are a religious leader, because they're an opposition uh, spokesman, is, is, uh, is evil, it's unjust, and uh, it is deeply detrimental to the best interests of Saudi society as much as the wider Middle East. Um, we're seeing the same thing in Bahrain, uh, several other uh, countries in the Middle East where, where one racial group is preferencing its rights over against those of others. It's very self-defeating. Uh, it's causing division within those societies and eventually those societies will fall. In um, Bahrain, the situation kind of differs in the sense that um, the majority are Shia mm. and not being sectarian um, as many Sunnis themselves mm. are with them in the sense that they understand that they are not being treated as equal no. as a, a Sunni. And sometimes even um, the government is bringing people from um, Asia and stuff and giving them Bahraini citizenship. Mm. However, a Bahraini themselves, yes. because they are Shia, they're not being yes. you know, um, recognized as a, a Bahraini citizen. How come the, the world is silent about that? Well, the instance you've given is clearly an example of where one family, uh, the king, whatever, are dominating a whole society, oppressing a whole society. We've seen it in Europe uh, in the past where a very influential family, be it a king or whatever, has dominated a whole nation. And they are only really interested in perpetuating their power base. And therefore they are cynical, they are... Um, crude in the way that they're treating uh, their own people, who are, as you've said, are largely Shia. I think Saudi Arabia is involved in Bahrain uh, militarily because they realize if Bahrain um, was liberated from the influence of uh, uh, the Khalifa family, that would have ramifications for Saudi Arabia too, because they're, again, a family dominates the society, albeit they are Sunni, Nevertheless, uh, those monarchies are despotic, they are autocratic, uh, they're feudal, the way that they, uh, they run their countries. And it's not in their interest to promote the Arab Spring or uh, democratic values, which uh, I think are intrinsic rights that we must support. How does the Christian faith and the Muslim, um, if you like, know much about it, um, recommend us to react to people like this who just love power? To speak out, not be afraid, uh, and, and to trust that God will use our words uh, to bring about change. Um, you know, the Christian tradition and, and, and the Islamic tradition holds that we are created in the image of God. We are equal, male and female. And, uh, and therefore we must not discriminate on the basis of ethnicity or um, social economic standing. And therefore anywhere in the world where human rights are abused, anywhere in the world where uh, those rights are denied, it's incumbent on us to speak out because unless we do, we are complicit in those, uh, those criminal acts. Many human rights um uh, rulings have actually been broken. If we look at Palestine, Bahrain, um, Iraq, Syria, the world isn't really actually doing anything though. Like everyone, like here in London for example, we do protest, many um, religious figures come together and we <coughs> do talk and we try to find solutions to help the situations but we're not actually supporting or helping them as much as we hope we can. So. Why, firstly, why is you know, the world quiet about this and how come many countries can get away with breaking all these um, rules? At the same time, what more can we do? I can only speak for myself and those people I know, but in my own congregation, I'm aware that the world is a very complex place. There are conflicts, war zones all over the world, and I can't necessarily expect my church family to be aware of, involved in, and active in every field. What I can do is urge them to focus on one or two examples and to get involved, to get their hands dirty, uh, to care for the poor in our community, to give sacrificially 
to uh, charities that are caring for the poor in other parts of the world, be it through uh, uh, natural catastrophes or man-made conflicts. Um, but I also look back in history and draw hope and encouragement from where we have seen successes. Uh, the slave trade was brought to an end. It went on far too long, but it was brought to an end, certainly uh, in, in terms of European involvement, um, through the active campaigning of a dedicated few individuals who gave their lives to lobby parliaments and to bring about change. Uh, apartheid in South Africa was brought to an end through civil disobedience, through ordinary people saying, we've had enough of this, it's got to change. They resisted the authorities. Uh, some of them lost their lives. Many of them ended up in prison. But through, through mass demonstration and, and, and mass involvement, change occurred. Communism in Eastern Europe was brought to an end when a sufficient proportion of society said, we've had enough, we want change. I believe we're seeing the same in Palestine. It's taking a long time, but I believe we're seeing a change uh, in terms of public opinion, social awareness, the boycotts, divestment, sanction movement, a recent vote in Parliament. We are seeing a change. I'm frustrated that that change isn't going fast enough, but I believe it will come. And as we, as we push for that change, we've got to ensure that the change is non-violent, is peaceful, and brings about reconciliation and doesn't simply substitute one evil for another. We've seen how the Jews were treated in Nazi Germany. They were exploited, abused, exterminated. But tragically, we see the survivors in Israel today, many of them perpetrating similar atrocities against the Palestinians. So the fact that you overcome one evil doesn't necessarily mean that it will be, it will be replaced with goodness, with, with compassion, with kindness. We've got to work at it through the process to ensure that we follow more the South African model or Eastern European model than uh, we, we replicate or reproduce the cycles of violence and, uh, and injustice. That, we, that ironically we're seeking to overcome. Um, many faiths, all faiths even, believe in peace and in love and um, treating your, your neighbour like you would be treated or even treating them better than you would want to be treated. Why do you think our faiths do, don't have this um, influence that it should to, to, to bring about peace instead of violence? Well, I place a responsibility on people like myself on the imams, on the priests, the pastors of the churches, because we must lead the way. We must show by our example, and through our teaching uh, in the mosques and in the churches and synagogues, we have got to inform our communities more clearly what the scriptures teach about how to live, and, um, and be willing to challenge those within our communities who are uh, perpetuating those conflicts. I mean, that's why I wrote my books on Christian Zionism, because I believe my calling is not to challenge Islam or Judaism about its failings, but to challenge my own faith community about where we have been more a part of the problem than the solution. And if we can do it, as we must trust that our Jewish friends and Muslim friends will uh, will themselves take responsibility where their own faiths have been abused or exploited by others. Sometimes um, in the UK there are a few mosques which tend to look at extremism or, and teach extremism to the youth. Uh, do you think the government can uh, like, do something to stop these things being spread because firstly they're not part of um, the religion and secondly, they're actually abusing and mm. they're a danger to many other communities and not just mm. the UK itself. I think that we, we need to make it a higher priority, but I'm pleased that the government is working closely with Muslim leaders and Christian leaders 
to root out extremism. For example, the Church of England recently passed a law that uh, clergy cannot be members of the English Defence League, the EDL, that participation in far-right groups is illegal. And therefore the Church has made a statement that we repudiate uh, those who perpetuate racism uh, in the name of our country, that, they are n that we must not associate Christianity with uh, religious extremism or political extremism. And uh, it's heartening to hear imams and sheikhs uh, do the same in repudiating ISIL or ISIS and, uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda, for example. Um, there was a show about this once on uh, the BBC where they spoke about ISIS and how the um, youth in the UK, uh, what they think about them. And there were a few people that were actually supporting, which was, um, you know, being a Muslim myself and watching it on TV is very scary because it's like, you know, you live in the West, you 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 know how you're meant to um, be tr treating other mm. people and 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 what t you know what type of sorry and how to uh, and how to communicate with them, but with this individual had it as no what the what ISIS is doing is very right, and and he was actually planning to join them. Mm. With these type of situations. Um, don't you think the government or the police can take them and question them or something? Mm. It shows the influence of uh, the internet, um, extremist uh, resources, DVDs, CDs, and we must be savvy and use um, uh, modern uh, forms of uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook and others, to actively get our message across so that it counters that of the extremists. You know, it's very easy uh, for a clergy, for example, on Sundays to preach safe sermons that uh, emphasize love and mercy and so on, but don't actually get down to, well, how do you apply that in a context of conflict or an interfaith context? So we, yes, we've got to work harder at uh, helping our congregations live out their faith in a way that will make a difference and will help uh, defeat extremism. Um, and yes, we can do more working together as, as uh, faith leaders to cooperate with the authorities uh, to identify and, and isolate those who resort to extremism. I mean, for example, a colleague of mine was aware of um, some of the individuals in his community who were uh, serving in uh, extreme groups in, in um, Syria because he recognized them from the ISIL videos. And I said, you must go to the police and identify these individuals so that they can be picked up when they come back to the UK. Because if they're committing war crimes in another country, they are uh, obligated to arrest them here in the UK. And if you commit adult, uh, sorry, if you committed um, a murder in another country, you, you are, you, you must be arrested wherever you are. You can't say, well, it happened over there, it doesn't matter. So um, it's very important that we work with the authorities to uh, educate people, young people especially, so they won't go, but if they do, to help them realise they will be accountable when they come home. Thank you very much for um, your advice. Hopefully, our viewers would take it all into account and if they do see any violence or any extreme people would, would report it because it's not only bad for um, the Syrians and the Iraqis but it's also bad for us here in mm. the UK. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for watching Beneath the Surface. See you next time.